Hi everyone, this is Scott Homan, the Witness Underground podcast, director of the film Witness Underground and the XJW Coming Out of the Jehovah's Witness Religion series on YouTube. Today we have a very special episode. We have a panel of three of the five artists featured in the film and myself as a director. This is a really exciting episode and I'm so excited to share it with you all to get to know the artists in the film and myself a little bit deeper. After the screening, we had a, a live audience watching the movie for the first time. We did a Q&A after. We had audience fielded questions as well as a deeper discussion between the four of us uh, about a number of topics. So let me get into what those are. Why the artists in the film left the religion what exit path they recommend for people thinking about leaving the director's background, my background in film from an audience question, how it feels to release the film to the public for me. And also Ryan, whose story is heavily featured in the film, um, how seeing himself portrayed the scene he was a part of and helped create and how that feels to be captured in movie, which is a special relationship between a director and um, a subject in a documentary, what the artists are all doing with music now there are available music collections that are mostly are featured on witnessunderground.com forward slash art. How long it takes to shed the XJW label, which I love this question, and we got really deep into that. How each person has moved on from their former Jehovah's Witness identity that you're sort of swept into after leaving the Jehovah's Witness identity. How birthdays still affect one of the artists because he just had a birthday. And then what we got really into deeply at the end is what we all believe now about life after many years outside of this faith group that the film is all about. And then something really interesting I loved to kind of wrap everything up was a concept called poetic naturalism. And that references Penn Jillette from Penn and Teller fame and Sean Carroll, an author. Enjoy the Q&A session that we recorded after the screening. And if you'd like to join a Q&A session or watch the film in this format, it's a film festival style live film screening with a Q&A after where you can directly interact with everyone. And it's something I learned from Going to a number of film festivals with this very film in 2021, after the film was finished, we went on a film festival tour with the film, went to 11 festivals, which is really exciting. The biggest ones were Genre Blast, where we won an award for Best Documentary Feature, Sound Unseen, which was incredible because it was in the hometown of these artists, and it highlights film and music, where they invited all the bands to come play live at a concert, and it was incredible and huge showing of people on the first day of winter coming out to support the film who hadn't some of them hadn't seen each other for 20 years so this is a huge kind of reunion of all kinds of people from all backgrounds in this community it was really really special uh, we went to new haven documentary film festival portland film festival and then some personal favorites were the wisconsin film festival filmocracy in los angeles which is a festival run by the founder of slam dance john fitzgerald who took a huge interest in our film. That just taught me how fun it is to do the live screenings and have a Q&A and audience interaction. And so I'm so happy to share this with you. We had a couple technical difficulties in the previous ones. I did put out a Q&A that was much more casual. So if you want to watch that, that's also out there featuring the same people. This one really dove into the depth of all those themes I mentioned. And I'm so happy to share that with you and have captured something that's powerful and deep and personal. And it's a, it's a great kind of relief to have captured something because so many film festivals don't really record anything. And if they do, it's just like, oh, we'll get you a two-minute Instagram snap. So we got a really full, in-depth look at what all of our lives are like, but also our personalities and got to capture some really heavy, interesting topics. And I'm so happy to share that with you. So without further ado, enjoy the Q&A and I'd love to hear what you think of it. We will be doing this every week through May. And if you'd like to be on the list to get to know when the screenings are, we're, I'm trying to pick one day and maybe shift the times depending on time zones. We have huge audiences and interest in Europe, in Australia, South Africa, and Canada, and a growing interest in Latin America. So I'm going to try to shift the, the time zones around. So be paying attention to what time zone fits for you. But we're going to try to do it all on the same day each week so that we can keep some order and you will know what to expect and what days to plan for instead of more of a sporadic schedule. Thank you again. And I look forward to hearing from you. If you like this kind of content, we've recently been on a number of shows. The JW Thoughts channel by Wally Barnett on YouTube. Really good interview. He did an awesome job. I enjoyed the hell out of that. Jexit 2020 with Riley. He had myself... Eric and Ryan from the film on his channel in a really nice interview. He's really professional. Cult Hackers with Stephen Mather. He's a psychologist out of England. 
and we've become good friends. He's got a great show, Bad Associations by Chef Clark. We kind of launched our film release with her podcast, awesome new podcast. I love her deep personal dive, long form stories. So stay tuned for more interviews and let us know what you think in the comments. One very last thing that's super exciting is we're launching the soundtrack on vinyl and CD as a pre-order. So first week of May, expect to see a new pre-order launch for the soundtrack. Every single film festival Q&A we've done, an interview we've done, somebody asked us when we can buy the soundtrack. And so we have done a lot of work to create a soundtrack and we are working with this company in France called Diggers who specializes in this and they allow us to do it with zero costs up front. And if you love this content, help fund the soundtrack, which supports the artists and the artist grant, which I haven't talked about on this episode. We have an artist grant. If you're interested in getting your art funded through this project, Witness Underground, apply on the grant application page on witnessunderground.com forward slash grant and you can get money for your art project. Supporting the film through Patreon, you are funding the grant. 20% of all money that's coming through the project goes to the grant, and that includes the soundtrack. So look forward to that. We're super excited about it, and we hope you are too. Thank you so much. Enjoy the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and to borrow from Wally Barnett. You gotta like it right now. Subscribe. Push. Yep, that's it. Push the button. Push the button. Okay, thanks. Enjoy the Q&A, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the Witness Underground Q&A. Thanks for watching the film. We have Chad Rieger, Eric Alvinell, and Ryan Sutter, and myself, Scott Homan, the director. These three artists are featured in the film, and we will open up to the audience to ask your questions. Where were we? We were talking about exits and why each of us made our decision to leave the religion. Chad was talking about having his uh, child. Chad, am I correct in remembering that uh, you told me a big part of it involved uh, the flood and you seeing an image of the babies oh, being abandoned man. and that really got to you. When uh, Lily was in utero, I did the oh so darling uh, witness thing of, of reading my book of Bible stories to uh, my wife's baby bump. And my wife had said it, uh, after the fact, like my first tip off should have been the fact that you were skipping stories because i thought even though the kid was in utero i thought a handful of these my book of bible stories uh, stories were just fucking inappropriate and i came across the my book of bible stories thing of the flood and i just kind of let my empathetic imagination go it's become a Simpsons joke at this point of the like throwing the baby over the, the wall, like, you know, take my child. But like, that's what it would have been like in that situation. Like you would have had human beings just pleading like, fine. Okay. I suck. Take the, the purest that I have to offer. Just take it. I've, I've come up with a, one of my favorite one-liners I've ever written was parenthood is the sincerest form of narcissism. And it it kind of is. It's the thing that looks like you and you want to push into the future. I saw that picture and I I read that story and I was like, these are just people who who are just trying to, they make mistakes. The whole thing really disturbed me to my core as my child is gestating in my then wife's womb. And that was absolutely the first thread and then it just became a bunch of a series of those. Like, how am I going to explain this to my kid? How am I going to, with my personal ethics, explain this to this person? And it just fell apart. Uh, it took six months of <laughs> weeping and a rending of garments. And then I uh, I attempted the fade, which, which just meant ignoring phone calls from the elders, <laughs> hiding when people knocked on the door. If you had to do it, all over again would you recommend the fade route to other people who are in this situation that's that's a really good question because eric actually tells like his side of the story a little bit ryan left a while before the rest of us and then a couple of us percolated out eric left like there was an element of him who was trying to keep shit 
contained, but also there was also an element of just like shooting guns down Main Street, like fuck you guys. Like <laughs> this is you know, like there was a little you know bit. I do. <laughs> you know, there was a little That's bit. my little brother. That's right. <laughs> and so you know, and I had this the yeah, the family and and whatnot. Uh, I was trying to like figure out like what's the best way of doing this. I really don't have a good recommendation for what I would do in hindsight. I know, I know it's such a personal situation for everybody, right? Like everybody has to navigate the realities of their their witness connections if they're leaving. But one thing I've noticed. That mm-hmm. is very true. Uh, that I think almost crosses every every ex witness, almost every ex witness I've ever met, is that you are damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. People That's will true. will do the fade because they're hoping they won't get shunned as hard, and they are shunned just as hard. And mm-hmm. other people have family who are more flexible, mm-hmm. and they're going to treat them that way, and. In the case where a family will be flexible and will negotiate into the gray area with you, then I can see it, right? It makes a lot of sense. You can preserve some some defensible relationship with, with family members on some level. If they're willing to take a little risk over engaging with you and you can take a little uh, emotional risk, it kind of makes sense. But for a lot of folks, like... I feel like they go through all this trouble to try to navigate their exit and they just are getting 100% shunned anyhow. So then the argument kind of gets down to what's best for you mm-hmm. as the individual, right? Like, do you feel, and for me, and I, you know, was also kind of firing guns down Main Street because in the sense that I did disassociate, I wrote a letter. <laughs> Son, you were firing um, bazookas. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, and and part of me fucking loves that well but it wasn't this is the this is where i'm kind of making the point you i didn't being, really to you. i didn't yeah. write a letter and quit uh. until i had already been shunned for a year people forget that on the timeline like i came out in early 2004 saying i don't believe this stuff i'm blogging stuff me and amanda separated the things in the film i stayed technically a witness until into 2005 and that first my it was almost an experiment it was like nobody's gonna talk to me anyhow or are they and it turned out the answer was absolutely not they're not going to Right. Like I was already bad association and I was known to be in, I mean, even the elders didn't want to go through the trouble of talking to me when I like met with them. So when I wrote the letter, I did it for me and I did it for my kid. And my argument was I wanted the emotional space to make positive statements about what I do believe not be defensive about what I don't believe. I don't define myself by what I'm rejecting. I define myself by what I actually believe. And I'm teaching my child what I think is right from a moral perspective, from a historical perspective, from a scientific perspective. And for me, if I was pretending I was still flirting with it, or you know how people like get disfellowshipped and i know many people guilty of this including myself at one point i wasn't disfellowshipped who will will say oh i still know it's the truth i'm not doing as well as i should whatever but i know it's the truth and i wanted to be able to frankly say i know this isn't true and for me that gave me that space in my own mind right because i figured the treatment i'm getting is the same either way and it and i will say it didn't get worse. It was already as bad. So for me, I felt such a relief to be like, I am untethered. I've cut this cord. I am officially not a member. All I did was resign from a book club, guys. That's literally, it's a <laughs> publishing company. You know, no, you don't get to have a publisher card on me. You don't. It's like working for you know? Tupperware. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to sell your plastic. <laughs> to anyone. And I didn't write door. a screed. Like I didn't I, attack him. I just wrote a letter saying I'm no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I have referred to this as spiritual Amway a couple of times. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, two things I want to say about uh, what you just said, Ryan. One, like, I was absolutely that guy. Like, I, I hung out. I didn't hang out with witnesses. I hung out with only worldly people for a, a period of time in my late teens, and early 20s. Still mentally totally in. Absolutely was not under psychedelic duress with a handful of friends. And, uh, and just like, well, I know the demons won't mess with me because if... If they do, they'll just send me right back to like my my head was still in while I was living a very worldly life. And that shit breaks my heart. And the other thing that breaks my heart, I'll give you a little bit of credit for this, Ryan. For me personally, I, I've met so many people who like I left the witnesses because those people are assholes. And I'm like, God, I, I feel the congregation I left was great. I left in spite of the fact that, I, you know. There's a Summit Avenue congregation in St. Paul. Those people were wonderful. Everybody was so nice to me. When I left, I had people like wonderful people that I go out in service with who would come up when I finally started opening the door. And they're like, uh, are you going to come back to the Kingdom Hall? No. Think that's a good idea? Yes. It's the best idea I've ever made in my whole life. But thank you for coming, you know. Because it was about something different than that. It wasn't a social thing. It was an ideological thing. And like you say in the movie, like if it was about kooky ideas, fine. I got kooky ideas. Everybody in this panel has ideas that somebody doesn't agree with to the extent that those ideas are toxic. Like that shirt you're wearing, Chad. <laughs> My girlfriend hates this. <laughs> likes Me the too. Cut. <laughs> she, she hates she likes the cut but she twists and scots the girlfriend but she but she hates it wow uh, but she hates it. she's like why does it have to be an american flag um, i'm sorry to throw it off i just no, can't it's help good. myself no, it's all good. that's actually a, a really good transition because we got questions hey scott can you tell us a bit about your background as a director first off let's see we had a really good arts department in Wisconsin. We had a really big education budget for the arts. So I grew up in Northern Wisconsin and there was a documentary film class for four years. I was in, in it for the last, it's two years in the last two years of my high school. So that, that teacher was kind of terrible and we made fun of him all the time. We had incredible technology at our hands and he showed us how to use it all. But he, he was like, you have to make something, I don't care what it is like complete and absolute freedom to make stuff. So I made a documentary about the Y2K switch like a year before the end of the world. And that was fun. I interviewed the energy company about blackouts and brownouts and what we should expect as the clock switch happens and the whole world ends. I had a cousin who was planning to move to Canada where he could survive in the wild. And he had bought all this like doomsday prepper stuff before that was the thing. And anyway, so I did that. And I made a lot of skateboard videos or like a thing in the 90s. And we did um, snowboard videos set to music. I had like Ween as my soundtrack. I fucking loved Ween. And um, song? Oh, the entire Chocolate and Cheese album blew my mind. Ooh. And I like loved mostly that stuff yeah. for that that content. Like if we if YouTube had existed five seven years earlier we would have been a hit i think because we were making such wacky stuff like being all my high school friends and i didn't and i was like witness adjacent like i didn't know that i was a bad witness i thought i was doing all the right things like i wasn't having sex unfortunately and i'm still trying to make up for that um <laughs> and but i was you know i i didn't really have any witness friends i had I'd one so we had a set of cousins who were in the religion and before our family joined so for me, like hanging out with witnesses is always like this really weird thing. Um, anyway, so I'd always like, I had this like very fun crew of friends in high school and I actually like finished all my requirements early in my whole senior year. I was, I didn't only had just art classes for seven or eight hours. Um, so we would skip classes. We had like a free pass to skip to go film anything. So like if, if you're way back, it's, it's that class. And then when I lived in Minneapolis, getting to know these this crew here, I was I kind of like left the religion and then came back, sort of like on my own terms. Like I, I didn't believe a lot of it, and I came back on to like please my dad because he's in it. My mom sort of like never she's always been on the fence, never like never went preaching or anything. She just like goes to meetings and then is pissed <laughs> and then doesn't want to talk about it. So I went to school, I went to college in Minneapolis when I was 
my last years as a witness for photography. So I learned it was like photography, digital media. So I did a lot of camera work and created a lot of stills and that was not video related. And I kind of dropped the whole visual arts thing. And then when I left the religion, I was like, wait, okay, I need to like, I need to do what I love. So I had photography school and then I took it really seriously. And I, I, when I left the religion, I was like, okay, I need to leave the country because I really want to just for the sake of like getting out. I went to the most atheist place I could find and that was Vietnam. And when I went there with a the camera and the idea was like help out an NGO organization with film, I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of storytelling, but I thought I could help them out. And I just like focused on that. And then that became like founding, finding other musicians because I had been a musician in high school and I made a band of my own. And then I didn't really want to keep making music with them. And I'd formed my own band in the religion. And that was similar to what everyone here experienced. So I was doing camera work in Vietnam and then I was doing music. But I realized like music's not my passion, visual arts is. And I started filming all the musicians I thought were impressive. To wrap up the whole long story there, I focused on visual um, filmmaking in Vietnam for like five years. That's all, like my whole focus was that. I had like five to 10 hours a week of English teaching and I would spend like 30 hours a week doing video creation and editing. And I made a doc, my first documentary, it's called Hanoi Mixtape. And that's about basically showing off the, the music scene there and its diversity and international, like multicultural diversity um, and, and multi-genre music. It's metal, hip hop, pop, indie, all kinds of stuff. It's, it was really fun to make. So that's hopefully that, that answers probably that whole side of the story. Yeah, I think we covered the other questions as well. Um, thank you, Self-Aware NPC. You also get yeah. the award for best username. Uh, <laughs> Kate asks, uh, how does it feel to release this art project into the world officially? It's directed toward you, Scott, as well. This has been like this huge creative fire under my ass. Ever since I first went to Vietnam, one of the very, the very first projects I worked on, the NGO, I met this filmmaker couple and I was like, you know, I have this story I've been thinking about telling. And it, it was like, I want to tell something on this topic because I was a few years into being out of the religion, deep into the full shunning mode to, to get back to what Ryan was talking about. No matter how you do it, you're, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Like I walked away from the religion. I, you know, my cards are stuck in some congregate. The, the Stasi has the file on me somewhere and, and they could never, everyone kept asking me for it. And I was like, I'm not sending anything to you guys. I'm not reporting anytime. <laughs> I'm not giving you my paperwork, but yeah, to come back to like feel, releasing this is amazing. I got to tell the story. I really wanted to tell exactly how I wanted to tell it. You got to see the most recent cut in terms of technical, but there's like the, the very, very, very release edit is like, I went into the final video and I spent like two days of my life making sure every cut looks perfect. Cause it's like the representation of my style that I developed in Vietnam with all the musicians there and all the music videos that we made of two camera edit and like choppy, rough handheld, adding all the energy of camera work to match the music. And it's, it's rough, but it's like, also like, that's my thing. I feel like creatively it is amazing for what I like. And in terms of the story, it, it was like a labor of love to kind of, learn storytelling with my editor and the co-producer Ryan Duvall, like just hitting each other across the head every couple of weeks with like, well, what if we move this section here? What if we cut this, this whole section out? What if we add this thing we removed back in over here? And it was like to the point of agonizing, uh, but like to, to finally like land somewhere where everyone was happy and the story's strong and people were crying. And when they watched it, it's, it's like, we've only gotten really good reviews and that feels amazing. And yeah, it's, it's like a whole, the, the phase now is like to show people the movie. And it's like, I've been wanting to show people this movie before the movie existed before I even met Ryan, you know, like I've been wanting to tell the story for years and years. And I started with interviews with the XLB coming out project. So like to have this final piece of work that like stands on its own is amazing. Right on. Previous to our starting recording, uh, Ryan, we were asking you about your reaction to sharing this with people, but I guess more specifically, how does it feel to have it released officially? So the same question to you. I'm excited about it. I don't have, I did not have the same day in, day out labor of love uh, interaction with the film that Scott did. 
but I made an, a large amount of material available to him that I have felt responsible as the, the archivist and curator of something that I thought was very special. And I've kept every, everything like not because I want every scrap of set list that anybody ever wrote, but because everything we did was very ephemeral. We made these things. We spent these times together. We did all this stuff and it ended so unexpectedly for me. And when it ended, I had such a feeling like uh, Esther, my wife, she can vouch for this. I, for like the first, oh gosh, three years, four years after I wasn't a witness anymore, I was almost rabid in digitizing every photo of scanning every show flyer of like trying to preserve what had happened because I was so afraid that especially after Rhett died, I was like, you know, at one point the Lavone consisted of me, Rhett and Mike Thomas. And I'm the only living person left from that lineup. And so there's all these memories and all this material and you see a fraction of it in the film um, that I preserved and cherished and I made available to Scott. And when I saw how Scott and the others involved in the film, in the editing process, how they took that material, how they respected it, how they built it in with our stories. When I saw your guys' interviews, when I saw the whole thing kind of like all coming together, like the biggest fear I had was I didn't save all this stuff because I, because, because it's just for me. I thought I was, doing everything I did with nuclear gopher. I was always feeling like I'm doing this for all of us, right? I'm putting this website together. I'm trying to help release this album. I'm trying, whatever the hell it was like, we're all a community. We're all in this together and we're all pitching in and doing things for each other. And I didn't lose that after it left. So turning that over to Scott and then also telling my life story to Scott, there was just so much risk in that getting mishandled in us, not looking um, you know, turn it, t t twisting it in some way. So it was a lot of trust. And so now that it's out there, I, I feel really, really good about it getting out there. Not because all of the stuff that we made back in the day was necessarily all great art or was all like deserves to be. There's a lot of, you know, cool stuff that kids did when they were young that they would love to share with the rest of the world. And they all can do it on YouTube now. And we lived in the VHS era, so we couldn't, but the the fact is that like i love that this is a movie as much about nuclear gopher and something very important to me as it is about the witness angle and the aspect of how that impacted all of us and to me that means this movie has preserved one of the most important parts of my life forever and the fact that it also preserves some really painful stuff and shares that with other people is worth it um, for me, for both, it's like a double edged sword. You know, it's like the awkwardness of watching people watch you cry on film is one thing. But then also knowing that, like, you and a bunch of people you love did a bunch of stuff that you all felt good about. And, and Eric, you summarize it really nicely in the film about, you know, how it was just such a, a special place. It was a special thing. And to see that get celebrated and then also tell a story that is important, it would be self-serving to be like, oh, there's a whole movie that's all just about how cool we were when we were kids. It would be kind of sad if it was, oh, there's a whole movie about how shitty things went when I got, you know, my crisis of faith. But to have a movie that's actually like celebrating that we were creative, <clears throat> that we moved on with our lives, that we still love each other, that we still like have a positive outlook like it's kind of a best of all possible worlds for me about how this could have turned out 
And, and, and it makes me feel really grateful, honestly. And I, that's why I kind of do want everybody to see it. Not because I want them all to go with pitchforks and torches to the watchtower headquarters, but because for me, at least, you know, mm-hmm. I want them to have empathy and sympathy for other people. I want them to feel some, maybe some encouragement or some support for whatever they're going through. And I like that it celebrates something that to me was worth celebrating because it was pretty awesome. That's a long winded answer, but honestly, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm really glad it's out there. A little tag at the at the end of that, uh, as a person who's known you since you were, you know, 18, 19, and I was 14, I knew you through a handful of your, like, putting your own creative interests on the back burner. And I would see you family, work, slash spiritual stuff, and then the label. Like, I, I saw you putting so much, like, you didn't have time for your own creative shit, but... You were also like organizing, uh, you know, release parties for these other crews who were who were doing things to blow a little sunshine up your skirt, my old friend. Like that, that's always been a, a bit of an inspiration. Like I, I, I like that. I remember you giving me rides home from the Kingdom Hall, and like oh, I got so many. Like, what are we hanging out next? And you're like, oh, well, I guess we can maybe go out and service this Saturday. Uh, so and so has an EP release party. We definitely got to make that happen. <laughs> God fucking bless you, homie. That's yeah. I, just wanted, I wanted to tag that on there. Well, I appreciate that. I will say this: I did always see myself as the sort of least talented Sutter brother artistically and creatively because I looked at Rhett and I said, "That guy can play every instrument." Like nobody's business he's basically brian wilson i looked at reed and i said that guy is the best live performer i have ever seen step on a stage like reed's got charisma that goes 10 miles beyond wherever he's standing and then i was like i'm kind of a nerd you know (laughs) like so so i tried to apply my nerdery to help as much as i could with the rest of it we have a great question about music yeah. from Self-Aware. What projects, songs, or albums are, all, are you all working on next? Sorry, I'm just laughing at oh. uh, Kate's comments about lots of sunshine up that skirt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have a ton planned musically right now. Um, Cindy and I are working on some stuff. Probably some kind of side project-y thing. Like in a more just me and her electronic kind of thing we're playing with a little bit. That's the main thing right now between that and, you know, film stuff. That's kind of the, my creative life right now. Um, and some photography I've been working on, uh, but nothing, nothing huge on the horizon for me. Chadley. My big goal for, um, January, February of 2020 was I was going to get into another project regardless of what happened. I was also going to have a really big birthday party that year in the universe slash show of us like fucking no son. Uh, <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, I'm trying to catch up with that. I've got a couple items in the fire as far as like playing music with, with folks. Um, the, like the moment I have anything concrete, I will be firing it over to uh, Scott for him to hawk. But uh, I hear Ryan's got a new record he's working on. <laughs> Ryan does have a new record. The last thing I released was in 2014, so it's been a little bit of a nine-year gap. But I do have an album. I am nearly done with all the tracking, and it will be coming out on Nuclear Gopher this year because I'm bringing Nuclear Gopher back. And I've also Mm -hmm. negotiated with a couple of other potential people about other Nuclear Gopher releases, including a soundtrack record for this movie. There will be more Nuclear Gopher music again. The Gopher will be reconstituted after a brief 18-year nap. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I will say, yes, I have been in talks with with a a rather handsome gentleman about... uh, the resurrection of a certain subterranean glowing rodent. We have t-shirts. So yes. we need, we have t-shirts. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I yeah, like, like your music doesn't really matter at this point. It's all streaming. So like, 
Yeah. We're, all, we're all glorified t-shirt salesmen at this point anyway. So. And, and, and Kate, you can actually download Day Trip's former verse off archive.org. It's listed. It's on there. Or if you reach out to me, I'll give you one of the uh, one of the very limited edition, uh, very homemade day trip CDs that we made for. I've never even had one of um, those. those I don't cool. have one of those. I need one of those. <laughs> well, if, if these are members get, of the band. If you get Chad made it himself in his kitchen. <laughs> yeah. It's not a CD. It's actually a tortilla that he just wrote day trip. On. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was waiting for this Delicious. batch, waiting for this batch of meth to cook up, and I was like, "Hey, I should." <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the question of music, there are a lot of available songs and albums out there. There's a lot on the website. So if you go to witnessunderground.com art forward slash art, there if you scroll down, there's a lot of available music, and that includes Chad's Ghost Army album. Eric and Cindy's high TV EP and a single, and then Ryan's entire collection on Spotify. You can stream as well as Bandcamp link, I believe, is on there. And then there's the NGP Nuclear Gold for Productions Vault on Bandcamp, and that has like ten or so albums, including some Chloe albums and a bunch of Lavone Lavone albums, a Rhett album, and and actually more. my, my is plan is to put it all. I plan to put every uh, one of the nuclear gopher releases from back in the day on NGP vault for download. Um, So I'm working on it and I'm not taking money on any of those, by the way, they're free, freely available downloads. We used to release the nuclear gopher music on creative commons. They're still creative commons. You can download them. If you use them in your documentary film, you have to give credit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's there's music available and the soundtrack is in the works. So we've all been talking behind the scenes about the soundtrack for the film, what songs that's going to include and what order they're going to be in all the all the fun, creative uh, music side, business side of the soundtrack side. And Ryan just ordered a test vinyl for to see how one company's um, vinyl works and the CD masters sound on vinyl just to test them. I have a question for anybody who just watched this um, or who is watched it who isn't currently on the screen talking would you recommend this to other people and and what would you say about it what's your yes we have a definitely from software npc <laughs> kate let's know from kate <laughs> <laughs> actually to anyone that's who very is apostate here. thinking there i guess it's <laughs> almost better to ask like who would you know have you recommend like we need help, right? We want people to see this movie. So, what's the best part of this help movie, up. and why would you say it's all of my cheesy fucking one liners? <laughs> the best part of the movie is Chad under the waterfall throwing the thing. Ooh, that's just what we were talking about behind the scenes while the film was going. All right, uh, that was somewhere. I love that it was a mix between music scene, the music scene, and XGW stuff. It was a very unique perspective. It's something that definitely didn't exist before. And I guess on that topic. One of the, one of my big motivations there's a couple of big motivations to make something. I mentioned it before that I had this like burning desire to tell the story, basically because of sh- my shunning experience and how upsetting that was. As a witness, I was always like, unbeknownst to me, on the fringes of the religion. I thought I was just a normal Jehovah's Witness, but I was very much sp- skeptical of it, and I watched every film I ever heard about that was on the topic. One of my thoughts was. Well, I've, I've never looked on the internet about the religion because you're not supposed to. So somehow the doctrine got me to self-police in that way. <clears throat> when it came to movies, these short, tightly, well thought out, well edited, packaged products on the topic, I thought, well, even a Jehovah's Witness might watch a movie. I really just want to reach the public because I think that's, I want to make a film that like touches the public and get, brings awareness to this religion that it, it's not a benign group of people that just, are misled it's actually like doing dark and damaging things Um, i want the public to know that but if i could make a movie that maybe people on the inside at least people that were on the fringes are skeptical or thinking and there's now there's terms physically and mentally out people would look at it or physically in mentally questioning people would watch it or even people who are out but still believe might even watch it out of curiosity just because it's a movie now there's like five or ten movies on the topic that are good but there's like 30 movies 
it's not that many. And if you make something that's sort of like really entertaining and fun to watch and inspiring, then maybe then maybe anyone would watch it, including witnesses who are super indoctrinated. Kate uh, just this, mentioned that the people who watched it with her were both super fired up and asked, did that actually <laughs> happen? <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I do love that statement so much. <laughs> did it actually happen, Ryan? Did it actually? Did uh, it? I believe it did, yes. I'm Fake pretty it. sure I've got many types of scars Fucking to prove that everything in that movie happened. <laughs> right. That's that's a great reaction though. Like they're fired up. They're yeah. like I don't even know how to say what that reaction is, but it's like it's surprising, right? Like right. to have that cascade of losses and it's and like you said, whether you whether you walk away and never go again, or you you sign your how do you say it? You unsubscribe from the book publishing company's newsletter, <laughs> <Yeah>. or <laughs> the multi. No longer in your newsletter. book club. Take this strongly worded letter, <laughs> <laughs> or you get kicked out by them because you mm -hmm. broke one of their rules. The results are all exactly the same. They punish you with the most severe punishment possible on day one. And then that's it for the rest of your life, usually. And it's dark and damaging. So yeah, actually, it actually happens to everyone in this religion. It's like at some point, unless you just are horse blinders, you know, for your whole life and you don't break any rules, you never live, <clears throat> you might make it till death without suffering their, the darkness of the religion from, yeah, from within your community. So I want to I want to jump in here. Uh, Software NPC uh, says the film is very accessible to worldly folks, even if they had no previous knowledge of the JWs. Now they have a great overview of what being a Jehovah Witness entails. Uh, I was just talking and how harmful it is, and how excuse me, and how harmful it is. I was just talking <laughs> to Ryan, Eric, and Scott uh, earlier today about uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, who is actually the bass player in uh, uh, Ghost Army. You should check it out. And great, I've great known man. I've known him for for twelve years. He uh, not a witness. He's so fucking sick of sick of like hearing me whine about like you understand. I lost my whole community. He's like, yeah, I moved once too. Like I get it. Like <laughs> I moved across the country. I get it. We're in the same spot. And uh, like he had, you know. He had heard a bunch of these stories, has no real vested interest in this, watched one of the screenings, and then came back to me with, he's like, you need to go back for those, those, the MIAs, man, you need to like, go get them and bring them out. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's like, that's their call. Like, we're here. We'll, we're open. But like, that's, that's part of the, thing. but I liked that it stirred a person who's, who's, not only never been in the religion, but also is like familiar and kind of sick of the concept. It, it, it still motivated him. Like you got people on the, they're sitting out there. They need your help. And I'm like, I'm here. But also like, you got to understand thought crime, son. <laughs> like, One of the biggest responses I, that hit me hard at the first showing of the movie that I was at in Madison was somebody who was not only not a witness, but was not even really touched by the movie so much because of the witness angle. It was, it was, it was a trans man who came up to me and said that his, he watched this movie. He came with a friend and he wasn't there because he cared about Jehovah's witnesses. He didn't know anything about Jehovah's witnesses at all, mm -hmm. but he did know about being rejected. He did know about having to fight, to be who he was he did know about being shunned and mistreated he did know about high control behaviors he knew a lot of other stuff and man he was in arms over this movie like he was really emotional and really just like and it, it hit me it was just that was that for me that was part of that was the connection to realizing that like all those things aren't jehovah's witness specific this is just a really extreme example but like that's part of why I I think it's important to do the movie this way. I'm just, you know, to bring it back to the movie. I think it's important to tell the movie about everything else and not as much about let's let's get into doctrinal debate. Let's let's talk about whether or not God exists. Like the human story is can you be yourself in a situation and stay yourself after that situation 
blows up in your face and people treat you badly. And that does it. And that was the thing that I hadn't even thought. Of. I was so wrapped up in myself going to see that movie and being nervous about how it was going to be and blah, blah, blah. And to have, to have him come up to me after the show and just be like, I did not expect this. This was devastating to watch this movie. I just mm-hmm. came here with a friend. That was probably the biggest takeaway for me for that for from that first showing after the fact was was just oh wow. Yeah, this is like a human resonance thing. This isn't just a Jehovah's Witness thing. And I don't know. I I still think that's that is more important to me ultimately than whether or not this explicitly hurts the Watchtower society. Did you tell him that when you were a lad of 19 years old, you had a 14 year old confide in you that uh, he found out his mom was gay? It's an arc we don't ever bring up in the in the movie. No, but it's when true. when I was 14 and Ryan was 19, I called him up and made him meet me in the parking lot of Kmart because I had I had come home from school and unbeknownst to her, found my mom making out with another woman. And I was like, just my, and so my brain exploded. <laughs> so like, so like, so, uh, you know, so many years after that, like you have like these uh, LGBTQ uh, plus narratives, like, oh, actually when I was 19, I got, I, I had this particular topic dumped in my lap. So uh, I'm glad it's not just this particular thing. The irony there, which you didn't just mention, but it's sort of funny was that it was your mom mm-hmm. who requested of the elders that some big brother from the congregation start taking her son to more meetings. <laughs> and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I started taking you to the kingdom hall because, because the elders asked me to, because your mom asked the elders to. Mm-hmm. So even though she was, she was gay and she was not clearly, uh, one would say accepted by that yeah. congregation she wanted me to bring you there absolutely so the real question is what kind of what's the next intellectual hell ride ryan is gonna lead us on to <laughs> <laughs> kate's got some interesting stuff she said someone who saw the movie said uh, that he spoke to the fact that now when he sees jw's on the street he feels like he knows the facts and his words that feels heavy do you guys have anything to say about that? Like the effect that this movie may have on maybe people who've had no experience, direct experience with witnesses, how it might change their perspective on current witnesses. I guess that's something I've never thought of because I guess I had a fear that um, like, I certainly didn't want to vilify any like individuals, particularly mm-hmm. um, it was more like the, the company you know, and the doctrine is where my animus lies. Um, And I I wouldn't want that to, you know, everyone's an individual and I, I, even the people that, you know, wronged me in some way, like I still see everyone as individuals and as people who need help. Well, Eric, I think you kind of like, I think you, you you put it really well in the movie. Like when you, you kind of put yourself in that situation like yeah, I should I should be pissed at a person like that, but also I was that person, and that and I was trying the best I had with the information that was available to me. Like it, like you were you were earnest, you were trying to be as authentic as you could, and and that's I think that's one of the most important things for me anyway. Participating in this project is like I don't want people harassing witnesses. I just don't. If you have the opportunity to ask them a question that might kind of like, you know, pull the thread, cool. But also, like, there's people like like all of us who, like, we meant well. We were doing the best we had with the information information we thought we had available to us. I don't know. You put it uh, really well in the, in the movie. That's that's great. Roll the clip, Eric said. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I had another question for you guys. I was just curious your perspective on this. I was reading a review of the movie and it was this very positive review and the person was really affected by the movie and they, but they, in it, they said that, and I'm totally paraphrasing, uh, something to the effect of 
the subjects of the movie are so emotionally scarred by their experience that they still identify as ex witnesses showing that they, they still have their identity wrapped up in that experience. And I guess I hadn't really thought about that. You know, I guess I, I don't, I don't really think any of us would like describe yourself. Well, I'm an ex witness, you know, in a job interview. Um, but, uh, you know, do you think there's any truth to that? Like, like, yeah. Does that ideology still have it, its hooks in us in a way, or is that just part of our experience as humans? And like anything else, you know, if you're a cancer survivor, that's not all you are, but you're a cancer survivor and we're survivors of spiritual abuse. Um, do you guys have anything to say about that neighborhood of ideas? I was always concerned about self-identifying for the rest of my life as having formerly been a member of the Watchtower Society because most of the people I've ever met who don't move on with their lives um, are unhappy and I didn't want to be that. So um, in my day-to-day life uh, and I, I, I think I know the review you're talking about in my, in my day-to-day life, I don't talk about this topic. You know, this isn't something that, takes bandwidth out of my day. I worry about uh, a lot of things every day of normal life, and this ain't one of them. But there was a time when it was absolutely front of mind. Over time, as I've gotten further away from the events that happened, like even the movie was shot, the footage where I'm being interviewed was five years ago. And so I'm already five more years removed from it than then. And if you had gotten me a decade before that, I was saying I probably would have been swearing and screaming and punching things, you know, because that was in my phase of constantly having non-existent converse or adamant conversations with people who were not there because I had to be, you know, Mm -hmm. like going to therapy and everything. So I think it's important. I understand why when we're talking about it in the movie and we're in that space, that's how it looks. But I think it's also important that people realize that if you really Mm. want to move on with your life, you got to get out of that space and you got to move on with your life and you can revisit that space when it's safe for you. Like it's safe for me. now. I can talk about this pretty comfortably, but I can't live here. You know, Ryan, you and I have talked about the fact that like this movie, notwithstanding like, unless we're referring to this particular project, we haven't really talked about this. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's so far removed from like kind of our life to the point where like, we have occasionally just hanging out been like, Oh, we haven't brought up any JW bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like, Oh, Oh shit. And a self-aware NPC said, how long did it take you to lose that uh, that uh, XJW identity? One of the, the, the best compliments I'd ever heard was somebody had said something like, I want to get to that spot, the spot where you're seeming where you are. And this is like after the screening of the, the movie in, in Minneapolis. And it meant a lot to me because like, honestly, like this project is the only time I really think about it. I think it's important. I think it's cathartic. It's still cathartic now, but also kind of like lending to like what Ryan and Eric both say in the movie. Like there's a lot of good intentions there. Like it's it's not it's not black and white. It's not just people who are stupid and they're bad. Like it's not that like it's it's letting go of those things and just kind of waking up every day realizing like these people don't mean bad they're trying to do the best they can with what they have just take a deep breath and then just like let it go a little further and then it becomes a, a thing where <laughs> unfortunately now if i ever run into somebody who's like on the fringe I like it's gotten to the point where I, I like to have fun with them. Like I'll make as as piercing eye contact as I can. I'm like I want to destroy your faith in Jehovah. Like, yeah, just because if they, it, one way if to they do it. yeah, it is one way to do it. You know, I mean, honestly, if that makes them run too, like that's between the them and their God. Honestly, 
Yeah, yeah self-aware well, question. I'm gonna just I'm just gonna answer very quickly and say about five years. Yeah, That's my short some, answer. Five years uh, from extrication out or five years ago? Yeah, I mean, like it, the first couple years, all I could think about was that. Then I went to a few years of therapy. Then I started living my life again. And then my life, I would say at five or six years from the moment I left, my life became much more focused on my life. I'd gotten it out of my system enough that I was more living in my now and in my future. And I was no longer worrying about what it had been. There's no like cutting line where you suddenly go, Oh, on this day, I suddenly didn't feel like I, you know, I felt free of it, but I did a very intentional deprogramming regimen. Like that was in, I was intentionally trying to put myself in a different place because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in a limbo. So I you, in, you want to went to targeted that, therapy for that. If you want to hack that whole thing, find a big brother archetype who's already paid for the therapy and just ask him. <laughs> <laughs> if you're one, referring one to me, I've, Chad, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. One thing I've thought a bunch about is the stages of grief when someone dies. And I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but I know it starts with anger. And I, I think that there's some kind of direct parallel. I believe I saw a book that someone did this comparison for people leaving a faith or this particular faith. Don't quote me on its existence or what it's titled. But I'm, I'm very curious about, about that topic because what I've observed from interviewing people doing the actually be coming out project and then this, and then just meeting people all over and in all different stages is the first couple of years are really intense frustration and anger and like disbelief I get, then that's one of the stages too is like disbelief anger disbelief so that's like the first five years people are like get into the xgw identity space where this is my observation where they are doing a lot they care a lot about what the magazines that they're publishing and books are publishing are saying and now they have a tv studio in new york where the leaders of the religion are now on publicly saying all kinds of things and doing broadcasts that are meant for their people their followers and they care about what they say and they'll do video breakdowns about they said this outrageous thing but look in 1976 it said this in their magazine <laughs> it's a contradiction it's like at some point you gotta stop reading their magazines that's unhealthy and, and i've always felt that when i left i mean i i was like deprogramming since we, the beginning of being programmed like somehow um so maybe for me it was a little bit different but i see people that are like five years out and they're they're fired up and they're finally feeling comfortable to make their YouTube channel or write their book. And then 10 years out, they're way more relaxed and they don't really care about what the religion has to say. And they're just, they might poke in on the topic on the internet. Like they're way less identified from my observation. Then there's people that are 15, 20, even farther years out. And it's just like, that thing's still going. They said the same shit when I was in it in 1960. <laughs> How are they still in existence? Like who's believing that the end of the world's coming? It's 2023. It's 60 years ago, they were saying the same thing. Um, and it's amazing that they still have people hooked on it for that long. And and they're just like super detached, but like they pop, popped in, but their identity is not wrapped up at all in it. And I think, I think it's like after the five year mark, it's sort of like, how much work are you doing on the topic? Are you like, how much time are you saying like upset about it? I think, I think it, it, it varies for everybody because everybody is different and everybody's exit is different for me it was a few years too and i think no matter what the pace the way i feel about it is at a certain point your identity as an ex jehovah's witness goes from being part of your identity to just being a fact about you mm -hmm. it's moved into the it's an attribute like you know i used to ski too but i don't talk about fucking skiing all the time um <laughs> and you know it, it it's lots of i don't know and it was it is very much like the stages of grief and um, at a certain point you hit acceptance and it's like cool you know if i can help some other people right on but i'm not gonna wake up and worry about this you know and i i one of the some some this is kind of an aside but one thing that i heard of like very early on when i was leaving or just investigating stuff is someone said, make sure you destroy your faith. And like, I didn't really understand that seemed like extreme to me and kind of put me off. 
And now I get it because like I see people who, you know, there are a lot of people who maybe like get disciplined or disfellowshipped uh, for something. And while they're out, they make some friends and then it's hard to go back in and maybe they get reinstated and they often get disfellowshipped very quickly again, but they still sort of believe and they're like internally kind of on the fence and it can take them so long to actually like go of it because <clears throat> if you don't drill down and like really like prove to yourself the good and acceptable and perfect will of Jehovah. <laughs> I always love that scripture. Go Paul. Fuck Paul. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That was involuntary. Go ahead. Wait, let's I'm, I'm pro Bible. Uh, <laughs> Ephesians and Philippians, there's some good I'm, jams in there. I'm pro Bible and <laughs> okay. Christian. Let Eric finish his thought, Chad. <laughs> Big brother. Thank you, Dad. Uh, <laughs> I don't, don't even make know us turn this theater over. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just think it's really important to really, really take that seriously. I mean, you don't have to, but I think there's a price to pay for it if you don't. I think there's a really practical point you just made, Eric, and I'm gonna I'm gonna draw an analogy that I think that um, anybody could connect to. When you were a kid and you watched TV, at some point. It may have you may have wondered how do they get those little people in there, right? Mm -hmm. And if you maintain the idea that television is little people inside that box, and you hold on to that idea, and you never replace that with an awareness of how a television actually works, even if you no longer believe it, but you don't actually know how the TV works, you might feel a little unsure. Like maybe, you know, you watch that one video of Bjork explaining that TVs work by little people inside the box and you go, oh, maybe, maybe they, uh, they do. But the point is that if you then learn how a television works, the minute you actually learn how a television works, you permanently eject that other thing and you eject any uncertainty about if that other thing was an accurate representation. So when you stop believing in something, but you don't believe in something to replace it, if you don't like fill that gap, you are left with just kind of an uncertainty. Sure. And you're like, you know, maybe Bjork is right. Maybe there are tiny people on the television. That's a facetious example. But if you're saying, I'm pretty sure I don't believe in a God but I'm afraid to actually investigate this subject and decide for real. I'm afraid to dig in and wrestle on this topic. Then you're just left with uncertainty. That's all you got. I mean, and, I mean, you know, but, you may not find a better answer. I'm just saying you got to try. That's what destroy your faith means to me. It means see what gaps are left behind by what you lost and see what you can do to fill them. But don't just ignore that those gaps are there. I feel like that's a constant. That's something I hear of people who are interested in not smoking anymore, not drinking anymore. Like it's established psychological science that you don't just get to stop. You have to kind of like fill that space with something. Like, and if you don't, then it becomes just like you focus on that absence of. Yeah, things. it's a missing tooth. It's a hole where you're just tonguing the hole mm -hmm. forever. And Indeed. it's not. I will. Uh, Scott, Scott and I were talking earlier today uh, and I had one of my one of the only things that kind of triggers my like, uh, like sometimes I like low key forget. Like, I, I know I was a part of this documentary. I, I, I have all these friends that I met through because of the Watchtower Bible of Tract Society. Um, but I like I frequently completely forget about this entire formative part of my life. Uh, my birthday was yesterday. Well, uh, Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. There we go. It still burns. Happy it still <laughs> burns. It still burns. <laughs> I got one very, very sweet uh, innocuous a recording of happy birthday and one very sultry thank you by the way ryan for the sultry um you're welcome mr president <laughs> <laughs> but like but like i still uh, that's one of those few things like I, i've acclimated to a lot of the 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 other holidays but my birthday like just they drill down really hard there's only two instances of birthdays in the Bible, and both of them very selfish oligarchs killed righteous men. And I was like, son, can I get somebody beheaded? Like, like how cool do I have to get in this town before I have to get a righteous man beheaded around here? 
<laughs> Neither <laughs> Ryan nor Eric nor Scott nor anybody else involved in the making of this film is responsible for the statements of Chad Stanley Greer. <laughs> we should just have that flashing <laughs> during all conversation. <laughs> Fucking implicit assholes. Um, but I, but I still, I still don't know how to like. Uh, yesterday, like again, and I feel like I have this like epiphany every year. It, it occurs to me as an epiphany. It's like you know what? Just, just let your friends celebrate. The rest of these people all get it. Like they all understand. Like oh, it's, it's your birthday, and and other people like strangers get to like just fucking celebrate you. I have no idea. That feels, especially as like. Like a, a you know a Norwegian descendant Midwestern Jehovah ex Jehovah's Witness like Jesus Christ that's multiple winnings it hits all of the women no it, self esteem allowed it burns so <laughs> hard yeah so like anytime anyone's like you happy birthday dude I'm like God is damn it, it though could you pity me <laughs> could you please pity me because that would hurt a little less than this right now. Yeah. I just uh, like to uh, I like to make the point um, when birthdays come up, I, I always tell them I am only as old as the number of birthdays I've celebrated. And with most people not knowing my background, they would assume that uh, to be my biological age. And when I tell them that makes me 18 years old, I get some confused people. It's pretty great. <laughs> what's, your leap, <laughs> what's a leap year birthday folk and ex Joe's witnesses have in common? They're both like 12. <laughs> <laughs> fuck leap year by the way that's a myth i don't know what you're talking about www.leapyearsmyth.com it's right up there with birds don't exist.com probably dude birds aren't real birds, aren't real. birds, birds are well established <laughs> science one thing that's a topic in a lot of threads of, on the xw space and in general in the world and people ask after watching the film is okay so you left this religion then what like what do you what do you, what happened to your beliefs like how do they develop where where do you believe now you're being pointed at eric oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at like if from my perspective it's these two because eric and ryan have both informed the shit out of my journey and i'm really mute myself well i mean that's a huge question what do i believe i guess in the context of witness stuff i'm not religious i've actually grown kind of uncomfortable with the term atheist as a self-identifier even though it's technically true, like it just feels kind of silly to me. Like I, I just like I don't, you know, identify as a to quote Dawkins an a tooth fairyist. Um, <laughs> you know, like it just it's not really a concern uh, to my psyche anymore. Um, but either way, I'm not religious, and I guess you know I I love science, I love art, I love connection and friendship and. You know, all the really beautiful human stuff. I mean, mean, that's that's good enough for me. As far as I know, there's going to be a heat death of our sun in five million years, and none of this will ever have existed. But, like, for me, that's not really a dreadful thought. For me, that's, like, in the incredible unlikelihood that any of us existed just in the genetic lottery on Earth. And we got to be here for a second for the party and just go, like, whoa, and then, you know, we're not here. But, like, we're in the woe stage, you know, like, the party is still going, and um, it's what we make of it. Mm. You know, stay in school. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt like I was doing a PSA. For a second. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, like Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut would have been proud. Yeah, it was a little bit Pocanani. Yeah, well, you know, somebody on this call earlier mentioned a book by Sean Carroll. I believe it was probably Endless Forms Most Beautiful. There's another book by Sean Carroll that I have just been reading actually this week. It's called The Big Picture. And in it, I would say it is probably as good of an explanation of where I've come down in terms of like physical slash metaphysical belief in the sense of how he, in this book, it's really hard to summarize a big long book like this, but it talks about how based on what we know about physics and the universe and basically spheres of meaning um how different ways of talking about the world um can actually go together and make sense and that includes from the human sphere with meaning and morality and and things all the way down to talking about the quantum sphere right and that within the the sphere of uh applicability there's different languages that we use about them different ontologies and 
what I found out of kind of trying to, it's not trying to rationalize science and religion. It's not trying to invent some mind meld of the two for myself or something. I've just found that I think there's a lot of dignity in accepting reality at as much of an understanding of it as I have. And there's a lot of dignity in understanding that everything that we do and everything that we are is all kind of interconnected in terms of how we affect each other, how we affect the world and how we are affected by each other and how we are affected by the world we live in. And that as long as I am able to worry about me and my mental health and well-being, my treatment of other people, feel like I'm taking care of that for myself from a moral perspective, because who else can I take care of the actions of other than myself, then then I feel like I'm doing okay. And and I know that's a really kind of abstract answer compared to like whether I think about I'm a Buddhist now or I'm a Unitarian or I'm an atheist or I'm a Catholic or I'm a whatever. I'm more of like, it kind of doesn't matter, right? Like the it, it, as much as I don't sit around and think about my, you know, non-identity as a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I do think about actively how well do i understand what's happening in my life how well do i understand how new things that are learned about our reality like fit into it and how well do i understand how i'm treating myself and other people and so religion kind of doesn't even enter into it it, 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 it if it, if there was a religion and religious view or religious person who is compatible with treating other people well and accepting reality as they understand it, and we can both talk about what that is, then I am happy. <laughs> you know, like that's all I want. I just want to be able to, I don't want to debate. I don't want to sit around and like quibble over stupid bullshit. I just want to say, here's what I know about the world. And then you tell me, yeah, I know this other thing. And then we can learn from each other. And the important part is we're treating each other with respect and dignity. We're treating ourselves with respect and dignity done. There's plenty of different people with different religious beliefs who can align with you. If you look at life like that and you don't need other people to agree with you. And that's the, probably the biggest thing I've learned. And it helps me, helps me get by in the world is that, um, I've got, you know, and and I do think I will put in the small plug for that Sean Carroll book. If you're looking for a, a read that really goes into this and sort of puts the bones on why this is a valid way to approach the world, um, he does a very good job with it. But I've definitely come around to the fact where it's like, at first it was like fighting against trying to unprogram myself. And then it was like trying to figure out is there morality without this belief? Is there this? Is there that? Do I have to be whatever? But I've reached a point where I'm just kind of like, I feel good. I feel good about what I know. And I like to learn things. And when I find out I'm wrong about something, I like to correct it. And other than giving Chad a hard time for that shirt, I try to be good to other people. So it's, it's not my fault. You're not. Putting it down. It's, uh, it's, it's good for everyone else. Cause he might not wear the damn thing. again. <laughs> We're wearing a band. Yeah. But that, you know, if that, you don't want me to wear it, I'll get out of it. Oh <laughs> gosh! <laughs> but, no, that's, yeah, yeah. that's the name. Of it. it's, it's, you know, I, I, I guess all I'm saying is that, like, I just like that I can be accepting of wherever other people are at, and I don't need to fight them. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, honestly. I mean, it's one thing to sort of stand across the street from some witnesses manning one of their little carts and sort of snicker about how they're, they don't do it the old fashioned way. Like we did. We went door yeah. to door, but it's, uh, we raw dog this shit. <laughs> oh, I had doors slammed in my face yeah. from the time I was two years old. Truth. But seriously, like, I don't want to go fight them. I don't care. What's the point? <laughs> one of my ideas for promoting the film <laughs> was to actually do cart witnessing. And have exactly the same cart, but like dress like a, a normal human Ooh. and stand stand next to them, but like have copies of the DVD and copies of really good books that are important. And, just, and just follow them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wherever they go. As long as you <laughs> film that too. 
Are you <laughs> when the first mo- when the movie was showing in New York, Scott and I were going around with flyers to get people to see the movie, and at one point we stopped, looked at each other, we're like, "We're witnessing, we're doing it with pamphlets." <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> and, so good! And it was the very first copy of the poster. Some normal postcard size. The very first one, the tagline of the film was a Jehovah's Witness experience, and I was like, "Ah, fuck!" If anybody sees it. They're going to think it's like promoting their religion, which is exactly what they do, right? Yeah, so, it was the opposite then, of the message we were trying to As say. soon as we left New York, I, I updated the thing and I printed a whole new set for the next one that was like a Jehovah's Witness exit experience. And now it's artists <laughs> leaving, artists escaping cults, which is a much stronger, clear message. We are not in this religion. And it, we moved the poster from being a guy that looks like a Jehovah's Witness, which was a representation of Ryan, to someone emerging from a very dark place. With a guitar, but with a guitar, anyway, yeah. <laughs> I won't regale you with this. But Penn Gillette's "This I Believe" essay for uh, NPR is fantastic, and I would venture to guess covers a couple of the people on this panel. Like as far as like, it's beyond atheism. It's like it talks about making this life the one, acknowledging that it's this is what you have. I was planning to read it to you, then I realized it's probably bad for this you have it ready to read right now yes go go for it <laughs> please <clears throat> i believe there is no god i am beyond atheism atheism is believing in god is it not believing in god not believing in god is easy you can't prove a negative so there's no work to do you can't prove there isn't an elephant inside the trunk of my car are you sure how about now Maybe it's just hiding before. Did I happen to mention that my personal heartfelt definition of the word elephant includes mystery, order, goodness, love, and a spare tire? So anyone with a love of truth inside of herself has to start with no belief in God and then look for evidence of God. She needs to search for some objective evidence of a supernatural power. All the people I write emails to are often stuck in this still searching phase. The atheism part is easy, but this, this I believe thing seems to demand something more personal. Some leap of faith that helps one see life's bigger picture, some rules to live by. So I'm saying this I believe. I believe there is no God. Having taken this step, it informs every moment of my life. I'm not greedy, I have love, blue skies, rainbows, Hallmark cards, and that has to be enough. It has to be enough, but it's everything in the world, and everything in the world is plenty for me. It seems just rude to beg the invisible for more. Just the love of my family that raised me and the family I'm raising now is enough that I don't need heaven. I won the huge genetic lottery, and I get joy every day. Believing there's no God means I can't really be forgiven except by kindness and faulty memories. That's good. It makes me want to be more thoughtful. I have to try to treat people right the first time around. Believing there's no God stops me from being solipsistic. I can read ideas from all different people from all different cultures. Without God, we can agree on reality. We can keep learning, and I can learn why I'm wrong. We can keep adjusting, and so we can really communicate. I don't travel in circles where people say, I have faith, I believe this in my heart, and nothing you can do or say can shake my belief. That's just a long-winded way of saying shut up or another two words that the FCC, FCC likes even less. But all obscenity is less insulting than how I was brought up and my imaginary friend means more to me than anything you could ever do. Or say. So believing there is no God lets me be proven wrong. And that's always fun. It means I'm learning something. Believing there is no God means the suffering I've seen in my family, and indeed all the suffering in the world, isn't caused by an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent force that isn't bothered to help or is just testing us, but rather something we all may be able to help each other with in the future. No God means the possibility of less suffering. Believing there is no God gives me more room for belief in family, people, love, truth, beauty, sex, jello, and all the other things I can prove 
and that make this life the best life I will ever have. Wow, I love that. That's excellent. Who is that? It's a Penn Gillette, actually, of Penn and Teller fame. Penn and Teller. Uh, Scott's uh, never heard of Penn and Teller before, apparently. Yeah. I said, mm. Mm. it'll show on <laughs> HBO. Yeah. That'd be a great shirt for the movie. Mm. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> for show. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I refer to that as atheist poetry. And if I'm ever in a, a conversation with somebody, and they're, they're they're kind of spitting the same ideas back at me, and I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta read this to you. And they're like, no, I don't want to hear it. I'm like, that sucks. You're in this small talk headlock right now, <laughs> and I got you, boo. I got you. There's a name for this kind of worldview that is in that Sean Carroll book. He calls it poetic naturalism, and I like that. And yeah. it, it reminds me of what you just read. It reminds me of some of the Kurt Vonnegut stuff. It reminds me of some of the conversations that we have all had. And I remember when Eric was going through his his deconversion, he went through a very strong sort of nihilism phase where it was all like nothing matters, heat death of the universe in the Sylvia Plath Tibetan philosophy sense of the word, our timeline <laughs> drops to zero, blah, blah, blah. My kid loved that movie, by the way. <laughs> I don't know what movie you're talking about. So anyways, <laughs> we do not talk about it on this podcast. Um, so I I was, I was, um, uh, I like the fact, though, that they're actually, you can kind of come out the other side of it and be like, yeah, nothing matters. So everything matters. <clears throat> like, there's no cosmic significance. So everything we do to each other matters that much more. It's just mm -hmm. like, yeah. I don't know why they don't. We get a responsibility that. back. Yes. Like the religion teaches yeah. that you can put all your responsibility onto God. You don't have to actually think about the state of the planet or the ecosystem or your impact on it. You don't have to think about how you treat others. Like it's, you can be mean to someone from another faith because your religion wants you to do that because your God is the real God. All that once, once there's no gods in the way then okay like like this poet wrote i didn't need to treat this person right mm -hmm. the first time i meet them it's like your only opportunity to like have a positive impact is this moment that's the thing that jumps out to me the most is the fact that like not believing in god actively means that i can't be forgiven except for by the grace and faulty memories of the yeah, people that i interact with yeah. And so, like, it's so basically, like, so just do your best the first time around. I, I will say also, as, as odd as this might sound, in a way, that almost gives, you, if you come from a Christian background, it almost gives you Jesus back in the sense of the character and the things he taught about te te treating other people well. Because so much of Christianity is about, Jesus died, therefore, the blood value of his sin gives us this cosmic significance and get out of jail free card. And so much of Christianity is not about have dinner with the tax collectors, forgive the, you know, those who sin against you, help the person on the side of the road who is dying. Like for me, at least, not believing in the supernatural stuff and certainly not believing in the symbology and the, the 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 blood sacrifice angle of the whole christian story where it's like this is about me and this person who died for me in the movie i show my personal bible and i in my personal bible i've got the jefferson bible where he cut out all the supernatural stuff and just said here's good stuff this guy said about how to treat people and i think that gets lost in this like the way witnesses treat their ex-members is like kind of in violation of stuff jesus says in sermon on the mount about how to treat people and yet you know it's all become about him dying and rising and this whole supernatural fairy tale with this melodrama and never is not about like be good to each other kind of stuff. And, and anyways, I mean, I know that's not a new take. I know that you can watch life of Brian and get the same takeaway, but <laughs> I'm just saying that for me, 
that was actually that's actually a thing that I I am glad about, which is like at least still has some connection to the history I was raised with, which is like some of the good stuff we learned. You just said things about how to be that some of those things are actually reflected in biblical teachings. But you when you layer on top of that. Oh, and also here's a selfish story for you about a blood sacrifice. Um and and therefore you can do anything you want and you can be shitty, but you're going to live forever in a paradise on earth. I think it's nice to have at least some piece, pieces of it that are still morally valid and that I can recognize them and that I still have at least a connection to. But I think a lot of Christians lose this and it drives me nuts. So that's what, all I was going to say about that. One of the, one of the best, uh, uh, I've referred to it as the one of the best ruminations of faith loss is Dave Bazan's "Curse Your Branches." <laughs> yeah, uh, that the, and Eric introduced me to this, and we went to see uh, Mr. Bazan at, at the Turf Club, and somebody shouted out, "Like, what do you think of Job?" And I think the person was kind of trying to be shitty, like I think they were inferring that, like. Bazan's experience was similar to Job. And he's like, are you talking about the mythical Bible character? And then he kind of gave a little uh, explanation. He's like, I, I think as cultural subtext, like, yes, like it's, it's significant. Like it's not dismissible. But also I will say there's the whole Pauline Christianity thing where like some of my favorite scriptures from the Bible are from Paul but he's also the one who wrangled the whole, you don't need an intermediary. And Paul's like, but you kind of need an intermediary. Like, let's just bring the whole Jewish hierarchy back right. to it. I think but there's I something know. deeply human about that. Like, you, I, it, like, if you look historically, any movement seems to start with uh, sort of this cool idealism. And then it, calcifies and turns into a thing that's very much about like rules and just like the structure of it remains, but the heart disappears. Like I think about like uh, the social movements in the sixties started with kind of the hippie free love thing. And it's, it's such a perfect allegory for this whole thing. Cause it was like the height of it, like Woodstock. And then right after that, you have Altamont, which is the same idea, but ended with the hell's angels beating the crap out of a bunch of the crowd. And then, that whole like let's do drugs and save the world thing changed into the seventies where they kept all the drugs, but it became this really dark nihilistic disco, like sad chunk <laughs> for a long time, you know? And it, it I, I guess I just see that pattern in so many human endeavors where it starts idealistic and pure. And then the only way it can survive is by attaching itself to specifics. And I see that. Definitely, the way the witnesses have taken Christianity too. It's, it's about rules all of a sudden. When, like you said, Ryan, like Jesus was hanging out with sex workers, and he said, "Turn the other cheek." And yeah, you, know, you don't hear a whole lot about that. I have a good example. Coincidentally, my Reddit name is uh, Disco Sad Chunk. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, a fun example. You're saying Scott? Uh, oh, so I had a job the last few years at a startup I ended about a year ago. And I read this article because I never worked in the startup space about how, how, how startups compare to businesses and what their lifespans are and how they normally transition from a startup to a business, a functional business. And every startup sort of starts with a very charismatic salesperson with a great idea and people rally behind that great idea and support it. And then money flows into the project and they hire all the best talent that they could possibly get their hands on because they're paying a huge amount of money to, because they have other people's money to pay. And the startup idea maintains this beautiful, like it's, it's idealistic and charismatic and exciting. And we don't know if it's going to survive. And, and the sta status is something like a startup like one in like 20 or I don't know what the statistic is, but it's like really one in a hundred, something like that. They, they fail before they reach their goals. But if they do survive, they become a business and a business doesn't need a charismatic leader. A business needs a strong business acumen 
not charisma. It doesn't need like the best talent in the world. It needs people to run the business and lower level pay. And like you need shipping and you need HR. And you need all these like typical departments that businesses have. And then it's something else. And then the C- the original CEO gets pushed out. And then this person that knows how to run business and is good with money then comes in and they cut out all the interesting shit. And then all you have left is this like Hulk shell of the business that has an actual viable product and all the charisma and energy and, and fun and excitement about the thing is now gone. And you have this, I don't know, Eric, you get a, at some point in the next minute, you have to come up with a product <laughs> that, came from, that used to be a startup. And now it's like a shitty business. That nobody well, cares about. I remember a certain uh, <laughs> web company whose motto used to be don't be evil. Google. Google. Yeah. Okay. And that is no longer their motto. Um, <laughs> they're like, that's, that's a very 20. Some of the words were evil. That's a very 20 teens mentality of there. <laughs> Don't forget well, when oh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple and then Jobs got booted about five seconds after he introduced the Mac. <laughs> and then they turned the company over to somebody who, like, worked for coca-cola or something and almost destroyed the company for another 15 years before they brought him back in so yeah the visionary leader sometimes uh has value later it, well i was gonna say just gets the boot you know it's a rare oh, case yeah, when they yeah, get yeah. to come back in and actually help out a second time maybe that's what the second coming supposed to be about I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we got our old ceo back we have jesus we have jesus we have steve jobs and we have dan Harmon. that's it that's all we have <laughs> god damn it um, i um, thought that joke was gonna do a little better what's I, dan Harmon doing he did rick and morty but He's still around. Oh, he created community. Oh, I didn't know. So did you get the boot from community? He got kicked off a of community for a year and then they brought him back. Like Jesus. Oh, okay. That's a really he, good NPR piece. The second yeah. coming of Harmon. But, yeah, no, no. Basically, he spent three days in the, in the wilderness. <laughs> That's 40 days. Uh, to give a, Zoom, to give wilderness. A, Jesus. Okay, so just to reiterate, our audience members of the, that have remained... Dion made a great film. It's about his art. It also went to the Filmocracy Fest, and we we're in a similar class together. And you should watch his film, Dear Ike, it's called. But Lost Letters to a Teenage Idol. He's in the chat. Give us the title, yeah. Dion. <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> and then Lady is an ex Jehovah's Witness who I met in Panama in January. And we did an interview there in Spanish, which I'm excited about. And Kate knows everyone in the film, and we met because of the film. So it's like family in the audience here, so... Happy to have you all. Thank you for coming. For sure. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Right Appreciate on. you all. And if you have a chance, I mean, you guys are all fat, big friends and friends. Oh, here it is. Oh, PBS.org. It actually got on PBS. Yeah, finally. After Beautiful. This for years. <laughs> it. Awesome. Congrats. Congratulations. That's, awesome. That's fantastic. <clears throat> it, the official uh, title is Dear Ike Lost Letters to a Teen Idol. Teen Idol. Oh, it's a teenage idol. That concludes the Q&A to our screening. Thanks again, everybody. We'll do this again weekly, I believe, for, through May. So if uh, you know anybody who wants to watch, let, let them know, and they can send me their email and watch the film and participate in the Q&A. Awesome. That's great. Look guys, guys. Have a good night. Later. Take care. Bye. Bye. If you like this kind of content, we've recently been on a number of shows. The JW Thoughts channel by Wally Barnett on YouTube. Really good interview. He did an awesome job. I enjoyed the hell out of that. Jexit 2020 with Riley. He had myself, Eric, and Ryan from the film on his channel in a really nice interview. He's really professional. Cult Hackers with Stephen Mather. He's a psychologist out of England. We've become good friends. He's got a great show. You got to check it out. Bad Associations by Chef Clark. We launched our film release with her podcast. Awesome new podcast. I love her deep personal dive, long form stories. We're going to be on soon. Very excited to be on Wendy Renee's YouTube channel. You should check out her work. A little bit culty, the Nixium podcast by Sarah Edmondson. She and her husband, Nippy, run that podcast. They exposed the leader, Keith Ranieri, and put him in prison. They're in their fourth or fifth season. Myth Vision, again, with Derek Lambert. He had us on when we first did the film festival run. And then Finding Paradise, which is a Minneapolis, Minnesota-based podcast of XJWs. If you go to witnessunderground.com forward slash press, you can see a lot of our past interviews. So we had a film threat written interview that gave us an 8 out of 10 film score. Really well written. Really high praises. Tone Madison did a really nice article on us during the Wisconsin Film Festival. 
Tone Madison is a music magazine. We have a WFMU audio interview by Micah Moses of Music of Mind Control. Capist.fm out of New York. The Barkley Hour interviewed us during the festival. That was really nice. Nobody asked us to do this with Joe Mitchell and Ruben Ortiz, another XGW podcast. Very well done. All those guys. Armageddon in Retrospect by Bo Fair out of Wisconsin, my home area. The Portland Film Festival interviewed us twice, which is really cool. Victims and Villains by Captain Nostalgia. They're an advocacy group that focuses on mental health and sobriety. And WSUM, a student radio in Madison, also interviewed us. And then again, we were on Myth Vision. It's been really fun to be interviewed, and this is just the beginning. I'm excited to be on a bunch of more shows, and it's not just me anymore. We've got Ryan Sutter, Chad Rieger, Eric Elvendahl, and James Zimmerman are all very excited to be on these shows as well, and more. So stay tuned for more interviews, and let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and to borrow from Wally Barnett right now. You gotta like it right now. Subscribe. Push. Yep, that's it. Push the button. Push the button. Okay, thanks. Take care.